Hello and good morning everyone. Welcome to today's session on demystifying cloud containers and automation. Before moving to the session, I hope I'm audible. If you can hear me, could you please type yes in the chat box? All right, thank you so much for your response and taking your time out and being here today. We'll be running a live Q&A at the end of this session. So participants, if you have any queries, you can directly ask to the resource person at that time. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sending you the recordings of this session to your registered email ID. And you will be getting the special certificate for this webinar too. So I would like to introduce today's resource person, Mr. St. John Providence, Team Lead, Linux Division of IPSR. He is a Red Hat Certified Architect with 14 plus years of experience in the IT industry and has worked in India and abroad. He completed his MNC, MSc in Computer Networking from London Metropolitan University and Bachelor in Computer Application from Bangalore University. He is also a Red Hat Certified Instructor and his expertise in cloud computing, Ansible, etc. made him popular as a corporate trainer and has trained candidates from America, Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia Pacific. I welcome you, sir. Before moving to the session, let me have a brief introduction on IPSR Solutions Limited. We are an award-winning public limited IT company that has been delivering high-performance IT training to stu students as well as corporates for the past 21 years. The company, led by a group of dynamic entrepreneurs and prominent academicians, has five branches across Kerala. Our world-class training team includes industry experts with 19 plus years of experience and also architect level certified professionals. The division of IPSR include software product development, training, placement and digital marketing services. Some of our highlights include during the last two decades, IPSR has associated with 250 academic organizations, which includes universities, autonomous colleges, technical and non-technical institutions. We are seeing Red Hat training partner receive awards from Red Hat for delivering quality training in India and overseas. We are expert in corporate training, faculty development programs, technology seminars, workshops, induction training programs, internships, and career support. We have facilitated training for candidates from 50 plus countries, including America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, the Far East, and Australia. We have delivered online training to 9,000 plus candidates during this pandemic period through our learning management system. We are pioneer in development of academic solution products ranging from simple websites to complex software applications that help to manage academic and operational activities like question paper generation, campus automation, accreditation process, and outcome-based education. So let's move on to the session. I welcome Sensor once again. Over to you, sir. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Saliha. Could, could someone confirm me in the chat box? Am I audible very clearly? Okay, yeah. Thanks for the confirmations and uh, very good morning to all. And welcome to this webinar on demystifying cloud containers and uh, automation. So I will be uh, touching the basics of cloud containers and uh, IT automation. And also I will be demonstrating uh, some basic 
practical scenarios on cloud containers and automation. Okay, so let's start with the session. Okay, so uh, this is the IT evolution cycle. So before 1990, we were using self-service. Self-service in the sense, just a computer or just a computer device, uh, which is not networked. So which means uh, we are using its own resources like storage, computing power, so everything which is generated in your system itself. So th this is not connected to any other machines. So just self-service. So that is before 1990. Then we moved into managed IT infrastructures. Like uh, there are some dedicated infrastructures for storage, that is storage in network SAN, then uh, dedicated servers for uh, running applications, dedicated servers for running database servers, and there will be a controlled provision also. Then we move on to uh, virtualized infrastructures because in managed IT infrastructure, that is before virtualization, we were actually um, uh, not using the full uh, resources available in the systems. For example, let me imagine you have a I3 or I5 or I7 machine, okay, or a laptop. So how many of using 100% of that resources? I mean, the full resources, the full power, computing power of I5 or I7. Or you may be having 8 GB or 16 GB of RAM. Or storage, you may be having 1 TB or 5 TB, 10 TB, like that way. But we are not using completely, right? So that is a drawback of a normal or traditional uh, way of uh, IT deployment or infrastructure deployment. So when it comes to the virtualization, you have I5 or I7 and 8 GB or 16 GB of RAM, right? So on top of your laptop, you have a operating system, it, it, normally Windows. Okay, in top of that, we can run multiple operating systems. So that is a concept called virtualization. So instead of going for a dual boot, we can use the different operating systems simultaneously. So you can have the Windows as a base operating system, then multiple versions of Linux distributions. You can have it together using a virtualization. Then after 2010, we, mo we moved on to cloud computing. Okay, so that's what we are going to start in this section. So what is cloud computing? Okay, in simple words, I can say it's a delivery of computing storage and network as a utility. Same like we are using electricity as a utility, water as a utility, right? In 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 uh, in, in in towns or cities, uh, that uh, gas and uh, water is actually uh, as a utility. Same way, suppose we have only some basic system. Okay, we are going to do a startup company. We are going to start a company on a beginning basis. But for doing some projects, you need some resources that, that's almost equal to I5 or I7, but we have only the basic level of hardware. So what we do? We need the resources for a week or a month. So do we hire the resources or do we buy the resources? Because this is just for a week or a month. So we'll hire the resources, right? So that means, we need the computing power. You need the extra computing power for doing the project. We need extra storage for keeping our completed projects. And we need some network for uh, collaborating with uh, other colleagues. Right, so cloud is nothing but a, a delivery of computing, storage, and network as a utility. So there will be a cloud service provider like AWS, Google, so they are giving the resources and we are taking the resources. Just like electricity as a utility or water as a service. Okay, so in simple words, if someone asks you what is cloud computing means, it's delivery of computing, storage and network as a utility. So we will go in detail. Based on service model, we have three categorizations. 
you might have used these services indirectly but not directly for example the first one application as a service you have using facebook gmail uh, google sheets then online uh, communication platforms like google meet right and this cisco meet so these all comes under application as a service so just think about that before the cloud computing if you are planning to uh, do, do a documentation you need to install some document document uh, editor tools right like ms word or ms uh, excel but nowadays we don't need to install into our system that we are getting as a service so that is an example of application as a service so there are online monitoring tools online content blocks collaboration is nothing but your google sheets uh, then google drive or yeah, uh, google docs then communication platforms like google meet this is commit skype then finance related applications so be, the main point is we don't need to install that application into your system so that is uh, completely system independent see i'm using this ppt so this ppt i actually uh, presentation as a service so this is actually presentation as a service if anything happened to this my laptop i can switch to another device and i can continue this presentation because this is stored and running from cloud so this is an example of application as a service second one is platform as a service in platform as a service we have uh, object storage object storage is nothing but your google drive yeah that is storage as a service then uh, identity management you may be uh, whenever you install some application it is asking for some sign up right so most of the time you are using facebook or gmail credentials for sign in so that is something like a identity as a service so that is also considered a platform then runtime that is application runtimes so that is nothing but containers so that is a second topic we are going to discuss we'll discuss later what is runtime and containers so that is actually platform as a service then queue management database as a service we don't need to set up database in your system we are accessing the database which is running in a cloud so these are examples of platform as a service and the last one is infrastructure as a service which means whatever you want whatever you want in the sense there are three categories like compute storage network so these three categories you can get as a infrastructure as a service for example virtual cpu virtual hard disk virtual network interface device virtual switch virtual firewall virtual load balancer anything which you already used in your physical data center can be hired or uh, utilized from this cloud providers so the best example is aws then google cloud so they are providing infrastructure service if if anyone is giving infrastructure service means that includes platform and application also because without infrastructure there is no platform without platform there is no application okay so based on deployment model we have three category public cloud private cloud hybrid cloud take an example of aws so aws is actually a public cloud google cloud is actually a public cloud so they are giving the resources we are taking that so the advantage of using public cloud we don't need to worry about the setup because aws is already there whenever you require resources like cpu memory or storage just log into the amazon cloud or aws cloud then take the resource I, I, in a minute i will sh show you the demonstration for that so it is scalable in the sense whenever you require more resources it automatically scales or manually you can scale out in the sense initially you may be require only uh, 8 gb of ram with uh, three cpus maybe later on depends on traffic to your server it has to increase so that is something like scaling scaling out reliable reliable in the sense aws is having a data centers across the world so we can rely on these uh, technologies from aws also in google inexpensive as a startup companies 
they are depend on this AWS cloud providers or Google cloud providers. They don't they don't uh, need to set up any prerequisite setup for using a cloud. Just a normal laptop or normal system, and rest of the resources are hired from cloud provider. Location independent, so you can work anywhere in the world, and uh, you can deploy your applications anywhere in the world. But when we move on to the private, for example, banking and insurance sectors or uh, defense sectors, yeah, they need to keep their data very securely, right? So we need a greater control on that. So that, that is the advantage of private cloud. In private cloud, everything is under our control and it is flexible, secure, and like public cloud, this is scalable, but again, it's managed by ourselves. But some companies are going for hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud in the sense for a banking sector, uh, the confidential data they will keep in a private cloud and they have some promotions and marketing sites, right? Uh, websites, so that they will run in public. So that is a combination of uh, public and private cloud, which is called hybrid cloud. So these are the three types of cloud computing uh, based on deployment. Okay, so this is a very uh, one, uh, one, of, one of the very important uh, advantage of uh, using cloud, auto scaling. So because of this auto scaling only, most of the websites are running 24 by seven. Just for example, okay, so if, if you are a student, you, you have access to your university sites, your college sites, right? So in, 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 in a normal days, that site require only maybe one or two CPUs, just for example, okay. But when a research out or when it's an admission time, more requests are coming to that website. So that website need more resource to handle that uh, uh, request or queue, right? So that is called auto scaling. So whenever there is a spike in uh, the demand, auto scaling future will automatically increase the number of servers, increase the number, number of servers in load balancing. So that whenever a huge traffic comes without crashing the website, so that happens earlier. So those who are not aware, of, aware about auto scaling or not aware about the cloud, they just run uh, with the basic resources all the time, but the traffic will be different. So depends on demand. When demands goes up, it should automatically scale up. So in this picture, you can see in morning and evening, it's a normal resources record, but sometime between morning and noon, the demand increases. So automatically the number of, so this is a physical boxes, the picture is showing, but in, real, in reality, it's a virtual machines. So number of virtual machines increases. So automatically the resources increases so that the queue can be easily managed. So in the right side picture, you can see how the queues are managed. So the queue is in a single line and there will be a pool of multiple servers. So that is running in auto scaling group. Okay, so normally there will be a two or three uh, servers serving for your website. When the traffic increases, automatically the number of servers increases. So three becomes five or 10 or 15, depends on traffic. And when the traffic goes down, it decreases to three or two. So it depends on your uh, instructions into that auto scaling group. So this is a concept of auto scaling. This is one of the very important feature of cloud. So because of that, at least most of the websites are running 24 by seven without any crash. Okay, so based on this discussion, let me show you some demo on AWS. Okay, so cloud is what? It's a delivery of compute storage network as a resources, I mean, utility, right? So, this is a dash dashboard of AWS. I'm in Mumbai da uh, data center. So you can choose any one of the data center across the world. So I choose Mumbai because that is near to our location. 
So low latency, right? So I'm going to create a, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 server because I don't have that operating system with me. I don't have resource to set up a server like a rel 8. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire the resources from AWS and I'm going to deploy that server in Mumbai data center. Okay, so I'm selecting Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 server, select that. See here, you can choose whatever you want. That's in the sense, how many CPUs, how much GB of memory and storage and network performance. So if you go to the last, the highest number is I think 128 CPUs. Yeah, 128 CPU. With a single in a virtual machine, you'll get the power of 128 CPU with nearly 2000 GB RAM. Can you imagine that 2000 GB RAM, then SSD hard disk and 25 gigabit. 25 gigabit what, means what? Per second, 25 uh, SD movies per second. So that is 25 gigabit. So I'm, I'm not going to use that because this is going to be really expensive. But whenever we re really need that resources, it is cheaper compared to buying that the real supercomputers. So this is something like a supercomputer. But for demonstration, I'm going to use the free tier. It's mentioned here, T2 micro. So I'm going to use one CPU with one GB RAM. Again, it's a free, right? One CP and one GB of RAM, I'm getting absolutely free. Here I can mention how many number of machines I need to deploy in Mumbai data center with the same specifications. So I need only one for demo. Actually, I'm going to set up a web server here. Okay, so after setting up a web server, I'll give you the links and you can, uh, I'll, I'll paste the link in the chat box, then you can check from your, your end also. Adding storage, see it's storage as a service. So previously, the computing and RAM I mean, the CPU and RAM as computing as a service. So this is storage as a service. I'm adding this virtual disk. And I'm choosing a security group. Security group is nothing but a firewall. Okay, I'm opening all the ports because I need, op I need to open the all the ports for accessing, uh, not, not all the ports, but especially the HTTP port for accessing web server and SSH also. So this is all part of uh, Linux learning. So we'll discuss later what are the prerequisites for understanding cloud architecture and their services. So I'm going to launch. For accessing this web server or this machine very securely, I'm going to create a key pair. So this is a part of security. So only those who's having this private key can only access the server, which I created now. So the server is getting ready now. Instant state is still pending, but it may take maximum one or two, min two minutes. Okay, it's running now. I'm going to access my server which is running in Mumbai. So I'm accessing that remote server securely. Why I am saying securely because I'm not using a password. I'm using a identity uh, private key. I'm not using password, I'm using a private key. Yeah, st system is getting up.
Okay, now the system is ready. Now I am inside the system. EC2 user at a server which is running here, which is running in Mumbai. So I'm, I'm, I'm accessing the resources from here. LS CPU, it's a command to check how many CPU I have. I have one CPU here and the RAM space, that is physical memory. So I have around one GB here. Okay, it's named. Okay, so now I'm going to set up a, a website. Okay, in Linux, this is the command to install some package. See, for setting up a web server, we need a package, right? So I'm going to set up a Apache web server. So for setting up a Apache web server, we need a package called HTTPD. So I'm installing that HTTPD into this machine. So just follow what I'm trying to say and just follow what I'm trying to demonstrate also because this is important for understanding the next topic like container and automation. So I'm doing it manually. Installing the package. So step number one is installation of packages. Step number two, I need to start the web server. So these all commands will be discussed as a part of Linux administration courses. So we have the courses for that. So that we'll discuss at the end of this session. So these are the commands used to manage the Linux administration. So system ctl start httpd. So I'm starting the web server now. Package installed, started the web server, but what about the content? So I need to set up a content. So I'm just setting up a content like welcome to IPSR. Okay, so this is what I'm planning to display in the web page. And for Apache Web Server, the default document root or the or the folder in which we need to store the content to be saved. So that is what triple w html index.html. Okay. Because EC2 user is a normal user. Those who are familiar with Linux, they will understand sudo or in, in Windows, I can compare like uh, run as administrator. So now I am running as administrator. Yeah, just a minute, I'm switched into. Okay. It's ready now. Now go back to the server. So this is our server, right? So this server is having a public IP and private IP. So in order to access this server publicly, I need to use the public IP. So I'm copying this IP address and pasting into my browser tab. See, welcome to IPSR is showing here. Same thing you can try in your system also. I'm copying, I'm pasting that IP address in chat box. Just try from your end. From mobile or any DE device which is connected to. Just confirm, any, can anyone confirm that? Is it accessible? Welcome to IPSR. Okay, yeah, I got one response. Okay. So this is actually example of cloud computing we used. Computing as a service. We use storage because we we store that content. Welcome to IPSR. It's in cloud, not in my machine. And we used networking as a utility. Because you are directly connecting to the AWS uh, instance, which is running in Mumbai. You are not resource using my resources. So I hired computing, storage, and network. So this is what cloud computing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. By considering that explanation. 
will have a different methods of deployment mechanism. You can just look into this picture. So uh, this everyone knows that we have a system, physical machine or laptop or desktop. On top of that, we have an operating system and we install packages, applications, application one, application two, application three. Right. So what is the problem with this then? I'm not talking about you, your user level perspective. In, in, in a production level or in a, in a company level perspective, what is the issue with this deployment? Okay, so the issue is these applications are not isolated. So why I, we need to do isolation? Because if any updation to application one may affect application two. For example, this is the PHP application, this is the Python, and this is another application. Maybe this application one and application two using uh, uh, shared libraries, but any updation to the libraries may affect the another applications also. So in short, in short, the applications are applications are not isolated. Any changes changes to the operating system may affect the application stability. Okay, so that was a problem with the normal deployment of application. In virtualization, we we resolve the problem by creating virtual machines. In the sense, if you look into this picture, application three is isolated from app one and app two, right? Application three is isolated. So if any anything happening to application one, two is not going to affect application three because this is a separate box in a virtual machine. Okay, we got the solution for the problem with the bare metal. I mean the first level of deployment. But again, it's not a problem, but again, the thing we need to consider the utilization of resources. See, for isolating the applications, we are running multiple operating system, which means just for isolating the applications, we are taking more resources. So for a company wise, for a business wise, it is not profit profitable. You got the point. We have the solution. Technically, the solution is okay, but the resource wise, higher amount of resources are used. Now you come to the third one, containerization. So that's what I'm going to explain. What is container? We discuss about cloud, right? So what is container now? So in containerization, we can isolate the application without the help of operating system. So that means we are saving the resources which are used by the operating systems, guest operating systems. So just a base level host operating system. Yeah, that is what that should be there. We cannot remove that. Right? But compared to virtualization, the guest operating system layer is not here. We just using a engine called container engine. So with help of container engine, we can easily spin up the applications. The advantages of containerization is the images are lightweight. So this, is, this is not an operating system, right? This is an application runtime. Okay. Okay, yeah. If you want, you can mix containerization on virtualization. So that is depends on your requirements. But these are the three methods for uh, deployment mechanisms. Normal way, then virtualized way, the containerized way. Now, what is containers? Like cloud, we should be able to answer what is containers. So containers are nothing but application runtime that access a shared operating system kernel without the need for virtual machine. So that is important, without the need for virtual machine. In previous example, in previous demonstration, just recollect that I launched a virtual machine, right? I launched a virtual machine. What was my objective? So set up a web server. So first I launched a virtual machine. Then I installed the package for web server. Then we started the web server. So just for running a single website, I, I launched a machine, virtual machine. So that is virtualization. But here in my next demo, I'm not going to create any uh, new virtual machines. I'm going to use containers for running the same website. So this is what you're going to see. 
Okay, so the container is nothing but an application runtime. This is not a virtual machine. We know we no need to create any virtual machines. Just run the application, and the application will take some shared uh, resources from the kernel. Okay, so we have the next demo. I'm going to do a demo on two things. One is a, a general containerization using Portman. So Portman is nothing but a container runtime manager or container lifecycle manager or container engine. You can call it as anything. For creating a container, we need image. Container is nothing but an application runtime. So for creating application runtime, we need image. So from there, we can get the image from image registry. Okay, so using Portman, how we can set up a web server container. So that is first demo. In second demo, this is an enterprise version of containerization from Red Hat. That is Red Hat OpenShift platform. I will be showing demo on using the OpenShift dashboard using GUI in graphical user interface, how I can create a containers in OpenShift. Okay. So first I will show you the first containerization on using Portman. So now I have a machine here. Okay. So using Portman, I'm going to create a container using Portman. So using Portman for creating a container, we need images. So I'm just checking images are available or not. So this is the command for checking the available images. If you don't have image, we need to download it. So we have an image for HTTP here. So this is not a, a normal package. This is a container image. So I'm going to create a container. Portman run is the command for creating a container. And D means run in a detached mode, that is run in a background mode. And I should configure the port forwarding H0, H2, colon, H0. I'm just configuring the port forwarding. That means this container will be running in H0, but in externally, H0, H2. Then use the image. Okay. Running. Then I'm editing the content using port my exec command. Okay, first I should get the container ID. So this is the command for getting the container ID. So this is the unique container ID. So now I am entering into the container portman exec with interactive terminal. And what is our container ID? That's here and get the uh, bash shell. Okay, same like what I did for previous demonstration, I'm creating a test page. Welcome to, this time I'm, I will mention Red Hat just to change that, change the content. Echo, welcome to Red Hat, and I'm saying under or triple w html slash index dot html okay i'm just checking from here a zero a two okay welcome to that so this container is actually running here in this machine control node And what is IP address, uh, IP address of that control node? It's here. So in order to access that container, okay, this is still running. That is welcome to IPSR is still running. So that is running in a different machine. This is actually a container. Then H0, H2. See, welcome to Red Hat here. So the difference here it is, this web page is running in a machine which means it's taking higher resources. But this web page is running in a, a small container. So compared to this virtual machine, less amount of resource used. But we got the output right. We got the output, we got the page. But the problem with 
the basic containerization is orchestration is not available. Orchestration in the sense like automatic scaling, automatic load balancing. So that kind of high available uh, technologies are not available with basic containerization. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use OpenShift. In OpenShift, I will get these features like uh, automation, then uh, Kubernetes, and uh, yeah, that's that is something like uh, orchestration. So these kind of technologies are available with OpenShift. So I'm going to create a PHP web server on Red Hat OpenShift container platform. So I'm going to set up a PHP. So a search for PHP. The image is available here. So create an application. So it's easy process. We don't need any machines here. I have the source code here. So this is my source code here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to IPSR PHP version. So my code is in GitHub. So from there, I'm fetching that. Yeah, this is the branch name I created. And this is the context directory. And I'm just giving a name for test. Okay, just creating a simple PHP application. See, my application is getting ready now. Yeah, it's building now. It's almost automated. It's still on building state. Okay, so now container is creating, it's running. So now I can access my web page here. See, hello everyone, welcome to IPS or PHP version. Okay, now we have three websites. One is created with a normal cloud. Second one is normal containerization. Third one is using Red Hat OpenShift. See, the main advantage here it is, you can scale up or you can scale out. So currently it is running in a one container. So this is a URL. This is a URL. I am pasting in the chat box. Okay, this URL is available globally now. So just imagine lots of traffic coming to this machine. I mean, this container. I don't need to worry about that because what I can do is with help of OpenShift orchestration or Kubernetes or orchestration, I can increase the number of ports or containers. So now two ports are, two containers are serving the content. Yeah. There won't be any traffic issues. Even I can automate this also whenever there is a traffic, uh, high traffic, increase the number of ports. So automatically the application will be running in multiple nodes or multiple ports so that the traffic will be distributed. We already discussed that, how the traffic distributed with the round robin fashion. Okay, so by comparing with the normal containerization, we have the advantage of uh, managing uh, the containers in uh, using the advanced to to uh, tools like uh, orchestration, then automation. So and easy, easy to manage. And we have the dashboard also. Okay, so this is Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform. And another advantage of Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform is we get support from Red Hat because this is an enterprise version of Container Platform. Okay, so by now we discussed what is cloud. Cloud have three types of services that is in first the service, platform as a service, software as a service. Software as a service everyone uses by default. Platform as a service, the example is containerization that Red Hat OpenShift is an example of platform as a service. 
Then infrastructure service, we already discussed that. We launched a virtual machine. Okay. Now we are coming to the last point, automation. What is automation? Just recollect the demonstration what I have done. See how many manual instructions I used for setting up a web server. So just for setting up a one web server is fine. But if you want to set up a thousands of web servers in a very short time, it's very difficult to do it in a manual way, right? So we need a automation engine. So Ansible is actually a automation engine or automation tool for provisioning virtual machines. We actually created the virtual machine manually, but we can do with automation, provisioning, then configuration management, change the content, that is configuration management, change the website contents. So that is a part of configuration management. Then application deployment, set up multiple web servers, set up multiple database servers. With the help of Ansible, we can do. So Ansible is an automation tool for provisioning, configuration management, and application deployment. So this is what Ansible works. We have a control node. In control node, we will create a script. We call it as a playbook. From control node, using SSH, secure shell, we pass the instruction to thousands of servers. So for setting up thousand web servers, by executing a single playbook, thousands of servers, web servers will be created within a minute or maybe within a 10 seconds. So basically, the time taken for setting up 10 web servers or 100 web servers or one web server is equal to same because this is something like parallel processing. The time required for setting up a one web server is only required for setting up 10 web servers or 100 web servers or 1,000 web servers. It depends on your resource availability. So I have the Ansible setup here. So this is my control node. Okay. So what I'm going to uh, demo you is uh, I have the Ansible file here. This is an example of automation script. This script is for setting up a web server in multiple nodes. So hosts all means I have mentioned one to five servers. So the instruction is set up web servers on all the machines by installing the packages like HTTPD firewall D, then start the services, then add the port into firewall, then the content should be welcome to IPS. Okay, so the, the important point is I'm just running a script, but it is creating multiple web servers. In previous demonstration, I just executed some commands, but that set up only a one single web server. But here I'm executing the script Ansible hyphen playbook web.yml. So I'm going to start this script. I mean the playbook. The automation is happening on all the machines now. All the machines in the sense I have four machines in IWS Cloud. You can see here, it's applying to all the nodes. Now web server is ready. I actually applied the web server script into node one, two, three, four. So where is node four? Copy the address, sorry. I'm opening a new tab. Welcome to IPSR. Same like that, I create node one. This is our IP of node one. Welcome to IPSR, welcome to IPSR. So same like node one, two, three, four. 
suppose I want to change the content. Welcome to this webinar. Okay, I change the content, then execute the file. So this changes is happening to all the nodes. Just imagine that instead of four, there will be a 40 or 400 servers. By execution of a single script, the content changed. Welcome to this webinar. Welcome to this webinar. Okay, so this is called automation. So nowadays industry needs the skill on automation that is Ansible automation or any kind of automation, mainly the Ansible, then the skills on containerization. This too is important because for a business, they need, uh, uh, what I can say, high availability with less amount of resources. So container is the best example for that. The container is using a less amount of resources and we need a less amount of time for setting up the data center or any project which you are, which you got assigned. So we need a skill in automation. So we have the courses, some courses, which will cover these technologies. So we, we had a discussion about containers and Kubernetes, right? That is OpenShift, Red Hat OpenShift. I have showed that demo also. So DO 180 is the best course for learning about containerization and uh, orchestration, that is containers and Kubernetes with Red Hat OpenShift. So that will help you to build and manage containers for deployment on a Kubernetes and Red Hat OpenShift cluster. So after completing this course, you are eligible for uh, getting certification like Red Hat's certified specialist in uh, containerization and Kubernetes. And for getting knowledge in infrastructure as a service, then AWS course is available. That is AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate Training. So in order to gain in-depth understanding of AWS service, so because this is a very uh, a huge ocean, AWS. So uh, thousands of services are every month. So it's a huge area, but it's important to get uh, skilled on that. I mean the cloud. And for learning about automation with Ansible, we have a course called RHC, that is Red Hat Enterprise Linux Automation with Ansible. So this course will help you to understand uh, how to write a code and how to uh, get skills on application deployment, provisioning data centers, uh, and also how we can manage the configuration changes. So that is completely uh, focused on automation with Ansible. And for understanding these technologies, like cloud containers, automation, we need some domain knowledge, especially in Linux, right? So it's better to start with the RHCSA. So this RHCSA covers the basic system administration tasks related to uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So we're focusing uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux on this RHCSA. This is a Red Hat certified system administrator. So you are eligible for getting certification on RHCSA, and this is for RHC, Red Hat Certified Engineer. And also, we have a premium course, which covers all these technologies. We have training and internship in uh, system administration, that is basics of Linux administration then cloud, containers, and automation. And the duration will be four to six months. Uh, you will be getting hands-on training, personal mentoring, and live internship, because IPSR is, is a company, so IPSR is having a division for software development and uh, IT support division also. So we have uh, a possibility for giving live internship here, and global certification that is from Red Hat, and from AWS, Amazon. The major technologies covered during this course are enterprise Linux system administration, then automation, 
mainly Ansible and Puppet, then cloud computing in AWS, uh, cPanel and uh, server administration, something about databases, then containers, dockers, then AWS developer tools. So we'll start with the uh, system administration one or two, then you can go for RxCSS certification. Then Linux automation with the Ansible, that is completely automation on Linux. Then RxC certification. In cloud and uh, containerization, networking is important. Hardware knowledge is important. So basic networking and server administration will be covered. After RxC, then uh, that internship with the mentoring support, that is AWS, cloud containers, and automation. Okay, so I'm pasting this link also in the chat box. Okay, so that's it from my side, yeah. So I'm open for answering any questions. So participants, if you have any queries, you can ask directly to the resource person. Okay. Yeah, it's great to hear that it's very clear. So I hope there are no queries from the participant side. So thank you, Sensor, for the wonderful presentation, wonderful session. So thank you, participants, for joining us. So thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you all.